So what are we talking about today? Group we are not talking about a group project, but who said that? We are not talking about the group project today. What are we talking about today? Chip formation and force systems. Why are we talking about chip formation and force systems? Because it's important. Why is it important? Manufacturing. For manufacturing, that was a really bad answer. <laughs> Today you get a piece of candy for bad answers. Oh, so you don't break the tool or the part or the stuff. Is that what you're going to say? So you can cut it as efficiently as possible. <laughs> hey, share with a friend. Yeah. To ensure quality. Oh, man, I'm really not good at this. <laughs> to ensure quality. All right. So seriously, why, why, are, why are we looking at chip formation the way we're looking at it? What, what are we doing? I mean, besides going to school. Uh, understanding how a cutting tool, like, actually removes material so we want to understand how a cutting tool removes material so we could do it better right i think that's that's the real reason and we're modeling it so we don't have to do it ourselves if we make a model we can well save time and money it was when i when i first went to graduate school i learned this saying and it was a few years in the lab could save you a few days in the library um, and so, and, and now it's even worse because now a few years in the lab could save you a few minutes on Google, right? Because everything that you, did you know that when we wanted to go look stuff up in the library, we had to actually wiggle our toes and move our tushies into the, like into the physical place where the library is. It, you know what they used to have in the library? They used to have books there. It's, I know it's, I mean, now they have a cafe and they got a bunch of computers and stuff. We used to have books there. When we wanted to go, so these kind of results, when people do these experiments, 
they they especially professor dudes we um what's the word like to feel important and one of the ways we get to feel important everybody likes to feel important just a little bit right is there anybody that does not like to feel important personally anybody else all right so <laughs> it's to do this with chocolates except I would find that I would sometimes hold it in my hand for a while while I was talking. And then the chocolate was kind of soft. I think it helps out with the caramels though. And it probably isn't bad with the starburst. But, uh, but professors, and we, we like to feel important. Everybody likes to feel important a little bit. So the way professors get to feel, oh, and we really only want to feel important among our peers. We don't really care what dumb people think. We just care what smart people think. So we uh, we go to conferences to get to get to go to the conference. You have to agree to write a paper about the research you're doing, and so so we go around. We travel to all these places and talk to each other about how smart we are. It's the thing professors do, you know, just for fun. Um, we do that and we report the results of our experiments, things like that. And so we write this paper about the thing we were presenting, and then we. Um, who has to do all the work though? Professors like to feel smart. We like to go to conferences, stand there, talk about how smart we are. Who does all the work though? The students do all the work. One, one term I had somebody who was on the baseball team come pinch throw for me. Is there any baseball players in the room? Nobody's gonna, you, you wanna throw? <laughs> <laughs> so you're going to throw them out at second base then, right? <laughs> Maybe we could make a robot to throw it. So we make the students do all the work. And we used to have to, as students, we used to have to physically go to the library. And who's been down to the bottom floor of the library lately? What's it look like down there? What's down there now? What is it? It's dark. It's around the journal dark. So, yeah. Two through and A through P now. A through P? Yep. Yeah, so it used to be those bottom couple floors of the library. We'd go down there. Well, this was after we went to the card catalog. Do we still have a card catalog in the library? Okay. So we would go to the card catalog. There were little scraps of paper there. And you would search through the card catalog using the Dewey Decimal System to find the thing that you wanted to find. Did they teach you guys that in school still? Man, what a waste. Just Google it, dude. Just Google it. But we would use our Dewey Decimals. I'm sure I'm, I'm sure all the librarians, like the three comments I'm going to have on this video are going to be from librarians. You're like, you need... All right. Anyway, we'd go down there. We'd have to hunt around. And so we'd find a journal. And a lot of times what we'd do is we'd go through the journal and look at the titles of the journal articles. So if the title doesn't catch my attention, it's kind of like uh, digital marketing today. So if you're scrolling by on the feed, right? If the, whatever it is, if the clickbait doesn't grab your attention, you just keep scrolling. So we would go through journals like that. We'd spend hours doing it. And if the title caught your attention, then you go read the abstract. The abstract is like the short version of the results, right? The whole thing. And if the abstract still continued to capture your ascension, attention, you'd put it in a pile. And you'd maybe mark the pages, maybe put a post-it note or a slip of paper or whatever in there. And then you'd do this and you'd do this for hours and you'd finally get all the ones where the abstract sort of caught your attention. Then you would bring it to the photocopier and you would feed in dimes because they didn't have little cards or anything. You'd feed in dimes to copy all the pages of your thing. Then you'd staple them, you bring it home and you read it and you'd do all this research. People say new technology is ruining the world. Well, it certainly has made that part of the world easier. So when you need to, I don't know, if I told you to figure out how much um, power it's gonna take to machine a piece of aluminum, and let's say you wanted to, uh, to run your cutting tool uh, half an inch deep, half an inch down, half an inch deep, half an inch over, so those were your, your depths. And you wanted to run it at, say, 800 inches a minute. 
sideways feed rate. What would you, what would, if, if we hadn't had yesterday's lecture, but I told you to get an A in the class, you just had to answer that question. What would you do? Yeah. Well, you'd look it up, but you'd start with Google, right? You'd Google it and then you'd try to figure that out and you'd go through. So yesterday I gave you a reference. Oh, by the way, don't let me forget. So yesterday I gave you guys a reference where you should look this stuff up. So where would you look it up after yesterday's lecture? Before yesterday's lecture, you know, just Google. After yesterday's lecture, what specifically are you going to Google? The machinery's handbook. You're going to Google how to get the machinery's handbook. Now, if you Google how to get the machinery's handbook at WPI, I bet you it comes up with my YouTube video showing you how to search the library webpage to find the machinery's handbook and then how to click the buttons. You guys could probably figure it out without the video, but if you can't, there is one. All right, we're going to look up the machinery's handbook. Now, but again, why was this? Why is it that we want to estimate power in machining? Yes. So we, like so we don't break things like the chalk. Right. So and so we can estimate power. And we saw that equation yesterday. It's it's something like um, something like power equals KP times Q times W times C. Was that all the factors? I think that's all the factors too. Oh, but hey. If you choose to, you can remember formulas. Kudos to you if you remember formulas. I, I don't recommend it. And that's just because I'm really not very good at it, right? I did, I think it's probably similar gene to the not being able to spell stuff, right? I just, details like that, not important to me. So I don't remember them. Uh, somebody, uh, a reporter once, gave Einstein a hard time. And because uh, the reporter asked Einstein how many feet were in a mile. How many feet are in a mile, by the way? 5,280, that was eerily specific. I would have said about 5,000, but hey, <laughs> 280 and yeah. What? Wow, <laughs> five tomatoes. Five tomatoes. You must have had a really good teacher in, in what's that, elementary school where you learned that? High school. Yeah, I, it, I mean, for me, it all blends together. It was, it was long enough ago where, like, when a question comes up that I think you should know the answer to, and it's a math question, I'm like, well, that was like seventh grade math. I understand that we didn't do all of that math in seventh grade, but I don't know why seventh grade stands out. I had a really cool algebra in seventh grade, right? I think it was algebra. I had a really cool algebra teacher in seventh grade stuck in my mind that it's all seventh grade math. Cause I think, I think it all builds on seventh grade, right? It all builds on that, that X plus Y minus B. All right. Down the seventh grade path. Now I got to get all those 13 year old thoughts out of my head. All right, all right, back to my true age, my, my apparent age. <laughs> all right, I don't, I don't recommend remembering equations. In, um, it was in high school, the, um, we, had to, we had to remember stuff. I remember having to do um, cosine, sine stuff. Like, which, which one is which? In the circle, which one is cosine, which one is sine? I, re I remember this, this is a thing, right? You see, you can, you draw the circle and you've got the coordinates here or something, right? And then you've got the triangle. And so one of these is, so this over this or this over this, right? There's, there's those rules. Anybody remember what those rules are? Yeah. Sokotoa. Yeah, I remember Sokotoa. I totally don't remember what it means. <laughs> it was exciting. Here. Mm -hmm. 
So Katoa, um, so C O S O H, so C A H. That's a lot. T O A. So so Katoa. Um, it sounds like a name we would give to a lake around here um, because we're trying to honor the people that we kicked out a couple hundred years ago. Um, so I saw, I saw an amazing t-shirt at the bean counter a couple years ago, person standing in the line in front of me, their t-shirt said fighting for Homeland security since 1492. The person was a native American. They've been fighting to keep us out. Um, so what, what does it mean again? There's, there's actually a, there's a point to this. The Sokotoa thing is not a tangent. So sign is opposite over hypotenuse. That's sign. And then cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. Cosine is adjacent. Oh, sorry. Adjacent over hypotenuse. They're both adjacent there, I guess, huh? Tan is opposite over adjacent. All right. Everybody remember that? I never remember it. I Maybe after this schooling, I'll remember it in the future. But I never remember it. So what do I do when I need to know? I know it's a thing. Right? I know that those rules exist. What do I do when I need to know? Yes. I Google it. So... Please feel free to Google it. When you're doing um, like homework quizzes, which I didn't turn on, one on for yesterday, but don't worry, I will. Uh, we'll do two this week like we did last week. So I'll turn them on probably tomorrow and they'll be due end of the week again. So two this week, just like last week. Um, even though I promised you three last week, we only did two. So it'll be just like last week, except I'm not going to falsely promise to do the third one. <coughs> When you're doing these things, and this one will actually have questions where you have to do mathy stuff, and you might have to know equations, and you may have to look up the equations, please know that you're encouraged to look up the equations. You are encouraged to talk to each other about the equations. Years ago, I realized that it really sucked when you caught students cheating on tests, like cheating on homework and stuff. It really sucks. Because you know what I'm obligated to do if I think you're cheating? is to call you on it. And if I call you on it, I'm obligated to report that to the Dean of Students office. And then, and the reason we're obligated to report that is because then the Dean of Students checks to see is anybody else reported. If the Dean of Students come back and says, well, this is the first time anybody's reported that person for cheating, then it's up to me if I wanna work it out with the person. If I choose to work it out with the person, we just report to the Dean of Students what we did. Usually, you know, you get a zero on the test or whatever it is. You'd redo the test, whatever it is. Well, all that's just a pain in the butt to do anyway. So my theory on tests is encourage you to work together. Therefore, you can't be cheating. Encourage you to use the... No engineers don't work in a vacuum. No engineer has ever been set to a task and been told, you may not talk to anyone else that works in this company about your task. You must solve the problem. It never happens. Never has happened. Never will. Well, hopefully never will happen. Right. So uh, please work together on these things as we do them, especially this week. Um, feel free to use that group that we created to talk about the homeworks, but talk to anybody about the homeworks. doesn't matter. Um, do that stuff. And groups, right? All the groups have had a group meeting now. Any groups that have not had a group meeting yet? All the groups have sort of thought of what it is you want to make, right? And all the groups have, was there anything else I had to do for this week? I think that was the requirement for this week. For next week, each group needs to have an elevator pitch ready to describe what they want to make and where they want to make it, okay? So each group is going to have, I think we worked out, it's like 47 seconds or something. I don't remember what the time limit is. It's going to be pretty fast. Um, so next Wednesday, that's what we're doing. This Wednesday, we're talking about chip formation in Sakatoa or Socket to Me. So, um, all right.
took care of that stuff. Please look stuff up. Please don't work in a silo, especially if it's got grain in it because the grain will fall on you and you get buried in it. So don't work in that kind of silo for sure. Okay. We can easily measure power, correct? On our machine tools, we can easily measure power. We measure power. How do we measure power on machine tools? Voltage times current. Voltage times current, right? So we can measure that. We can estimate how much of it gets to the cutting tool by just guesstimating. Or we can watch how much power we're consuming when the cutting tool is spinning, but it's not actually engaging the workpiece. So we can sort of even that out. We can figure that stuff out. And power equals KP times Q times W times C. Now, of course, it's not equals, right? This is an estimate of power. When we're measuring power, power actually equals to the best of our ability to measure it. But here we're estimating power. The nice thing about this is we can do it before we start cutting. What's the orientation of this power that we're estimating or measuring? Either one. So where, where's the power being applied? Yeah. So the power is being applied to the... Oh, man. That was a close one. It's a bad class to fall asleep in. The, uh, the power is being applied at the cutting edge of the tool. Oh, cool. We had a picture up here. So that, that cutting edge of the tool is right here where the power is being applied. Now, we're going to use this Sokotoa thing, right? Because we're going to talk about some geometry of the tools. And the geometry of motion. Now, in this picture, what, what, direction, is the, uh, what direction is the tool moving? To your left, yes. The tool is moving to your left in this picture. Yeah, it would be the left if you're watching from home too. It's moving through the workpiece or the workpiece material is moving to the right in this picture. And we're zoomed in on the cutting edge of the tool with the microscope. And what do you see, what do you notice about this region up here that's labeled as T2 in the picture? What do you notice about that? Yes. The grains, look all scrunched up. the grains look all scrunched up. So the grains look all scrunched up because they are. So the material has been changed from its where, where T1 and where everything else is in that workpiece material. It's its state that it was in before we cut it. When that squishing happened, we did work on the workpiece. Everybody willing to believe that? Work was done on the workpiece. So what's work again? Yeah. So force through distance? Force times distance, right? So we did work on the workpiece. What direction is the force in this picture? The, the, the force that did that work? Yeah. Because forces have direction, right? To our left. To our left. For some reason, I can hit that row and I have trouble with all the other rows. It's to our left. So it's lined up right along sort of this blue line here. Now, oh, and that force that's lined up with that blue line in this picture, we call that the cutting force. Engineers, again, we're very imaginative. So if I draw it on the board, here, oh, I wished for more of this chalk yesterday and look at that. This is amazing. It's so exciting. It is like sidewalk chalk, but I think it was actually designed for a chalkboard. It is. That's the one I wanted. All right. Oh, but now I don't have the picture to look at again. All right, let me draw the picture. So we had, there was a tool here, right? 
Here we had a chip going up here. And this is chip. And we had some workpiece. And we had some workpiece. Except I put that workpiece label right in the wrong spot. You guys know that's the workpiece, right? All right. So cutting edge of the tool is right here. So if we were doing an outside diameter turning operation, we'd have a part that looks like this. So it's, it's round, right? It can rotate around. We'd have a cutting tool that's right here that's feeding in this direction through the workpiece. And the workpiece is rotating like this, around like that. If only this wasn't all a yellow. So the view we're looking at is right along the edge of the cutting tool here. So I'm going to pass these around. This one you shouldn't eat. These I want back. But just remember that this, the, so there's a chip that's forming on the edge of the tool. The view that we're looking at here is right down the edge of that tool. So you can look at that <clears throat> and see everything going through there. So as we do that, the force that we can identify easily is this cutting force. And because we're engineers and we have no um, imagination, we call that F sub C, force of cutting. Is that the only force that's actually acting here? No. What other, for about the picture here that we've drawn, what other forces can you infer must be happening? There must be something pushing up on the chip. So the chip is pushing the tool away, right? So right here at this interface between the edge of the tool and the chip, the chip is sliding along there. And so if I slide, if I slide my chip across the tool, I'm applying a force to it, right? Because I've got friction between my chip and my tool. So we know that there's got to be a force that's aligned here with the direction of the tool. What else must be happening? Yes. Some normal force that's like holding the workpiece in place, like some clamping force. Of some sort. Right. So there's clamping force that's up that's holding the workpiece and making it. Actually, what direction is the workpiece rotating here? So you see, this looks like a, a straight line. It's really just really way zoomed in on the roundy round part. So the, the workpiece is turning this way if the tool is moving through the workpiece in that direction, right? So yes, that's happening. And we can, we can actually, one of the ways that people measure forces, when, so we, it's really easy to measure the power that's going to the machine tool. One of the ways that we measure forces is by putting a force dynamometer right on those clamps. So we clamp the thing with the force dynamometer on there, and then we can get three axis forces coming off of that. And if it's a fast enough response, we can get dynamic cutting forces off of that. We're looking right now at the steady state, though. We're going to assume that it's moving at a steady state and all that stuff. We've got this force. So there's a friction force that's pushing on the tool up that way. So the tool's pushing on the workpiece with this. So we already used F sub C up here for cutting force. So this is, again, very inventive. We call that friction force F. Now to have a friction force, what other force do we have to have? Yes. We have to have a normal force. And that normal force will be perpendicular to the friction force, right? But I may have put the arrow in the wrong direction. That normal force might be negative. We'll figure it out in a minute. I think I put it in the right direction. So the cutting force, this is coming from rotating the spindle. 
that's the power we're putting into that spindle to rotate it along. But to counteract that friction force, we've got to push back again, right? So we can actually, yeah, I did draw the arrow the wrong direction here. We can actually put a component called the thrust force, F sub T. And so this plus this has to equal the friction force plus the normal force. So the cutting force and the thrust force has to equal the friction force plus the normal force. Why is that so? Yeah. Yes. Well, it is moving, but it's not accelerating, right? I am really good at hitting that row, even when I'm not trying to, right? So if they're not equal to each other, the part would be accelerating away or the tool would be accelerating away. So the cutting force and the thrust force added together, the friction force and the normal force added together. But this is not really all that's going on, right? So the, so the, the machine tool is a pr providing the FC and the F, F um, T. That's supposed to be a T. I just didn't finish drawing the T. So the machine tool is providing FC and FT. The chip sliding along the tool is providing that F, the friction force, and N, the normal force. And so what do we need to know if we want to move from one of those four? These are called orthogonal force systems. And so what do we need to know, know if we want to move from one orthogonal force system to the other where the resultant force P is always the same. Let me get a cleaner drawing of that. So if our tool is here, P is our resultant force. So we got FT plus FC equals P. We've also got that'll be lined up here. So that's N and that's F. What do we need to know in order to convert from FC and FT? Because those we can easily measure. We need to know how to add vectors. Or we need to transform from one system to the other. Don't we need to know the angle between them? Right? So that's going to come in handy. Now, let me draw the rest of this, right? Because I've got my workpiece and my chip. And my workpiece over here, I really don't care about that. In that initial diagram, we talked about T1 and T2. So what do you think we should call T2? What should we call T2? It's okay if it's not the same thing I wanted to call it. What, what would you call T2 if you were drawing this and, and designing the experiment to figure it out? Can we call it the chip thickness? Because it is actually the thickness of the chip. All right, so T2 is the chip thickness. How do we know what T2 is when we're doing an experiment? Yes. We measure it. We pick the chips up off the bottom of the machine tool. Um, what do you think we should call T1? If T2 is the chip thickness, what should we call T1? Yeah. Uh, depth of cut. We should absolutely not call it the depth of cut. <laughs> it's so tempting to call it the depth of cut. And 
I've seen people who write papers about this. People still write papers about this. Right now, what people is really excited about is what's the smallest chip you could possibly make. That's sort of exciting because that helps us do micro machining and stuff like that, nano machining. But um, so it really bugs me when people call it the, um, what do you call it, the depth of cut? Yeah, because in this diagram with our turning thing, the depth of cut is actually in and out of the board. Is it? The direction that we're moving here, so the, the velocity is that direction, remember? But that velocity is coming from the spinny bit, from the spinning. The depth of cut is how far into the part have we pushed our tooltip in a turning exercise. And so this bit that we haven't cut yet, it's a thickness. We call it the uncut chip thickness. So we have the chip thickness and the uncut chip thickness. And it is related not to the depth of cut, but the feed rate. Who could visualize how it's related to the feed rate? Right. Who's got the little yellow, yellow tool thing? So you see the ridges on the yellow tool thing? Each ridge on that little, at the, the part that's already been cut, each ridge on there indicates one revolution of the spindle. Right? So that's how far did the tool move in one revolution of the spindle. And so this uncut chip thickness in an ideal situation is equal to how far did the tool move in one revolution of the spindle? I say ideal. It's not really ideal, it's just unique. In one unique situation, it's equal to that. Somewhere. Oh, there's no more empty chalkboards. Okay. Let's look at the part from a different orientation. We've got our workpiece. So here's our workpiece, not drawn to scale. Um, you guys can probably see the top better than you can see the bottom. I'll draw the tool up here. So that's the tool. Now in this shape, there's an angle between the direction of feed and the edge of the tool. And that's typically true. Typically when we're doing these cutting operations, we have an angle between the edge of the tool and the direction of the feed. The feed direction is this direction, right? And so we've got this angle. And so that angle, again, we're very imaginative as engineers. Side edge cutting angle. Sometimes I call it beta, but people yell at me because beta means something else apparently in this equation. But I've never seen beta used as anything except for side edge cutting angle. When I use it for that, people yell at me about that sometimes. Side edge cutting angle. And so the uncut chip thickness here equals feed times cosine of the side edge cutting angle, always. So when the side edge cutting angle is zero, what's the cosine? One. So it's equal to the feed when the side edge cutting angle is zero. So if in this diagram, instead of having that angle there, the tool had been like that shape, then the 
uncut chip thickness would be equal to the feed rate. So chip thickness, we measure. Uncut chip thickness, we choose because we pick the feed rate and we pick the side edge cutting angle. Those are both process variables that we get to pick. Okay. How does that help us? What's the other angle that we see in this diagram? So you can't see the side edge cutting angle in this diagram because it's in and out of the board. But you can see another angle here, right? We've got the angle of the face of the tool relative to straight up and down. So this tool, and so if you, who's got one of the yellow things? You've had that yellow thing for a while. Has it already gone around? Oh, okay. Toss it back up. Should have had the baseball player throw it. Of course, it's not a baseball shape. I'm not sure being on the baseball team would really help with throwing of candies. All right, so we're looking at this part like this, right? And so the angle I'm talking about is zero in this shape. But if we tilted the tool this way or this way, so side edge cutting angle is tilting the tool like this. And the, um, the rake angle would be twisting the tool like this. And that's this angle here. We call it the rake angle. And so that rake angle, we get to pick it when we set up the machine tool. We could change the holder. Actually, some, with the, uh, the tools that we're using typically in the, in the labs, they're a steel block that holds a silicon carbide insert. That silicon carbide insert has some geometry on the top of it. That top face that we're talking about, this face here where the chip is forming on the tool, that's the rake face of the tool. So the chip always forms and slides along the rake face of the tool. And so we can change that angle. Now, what do you think changing that angle is going to do? It's not going to change the uncut chip thickness, right? Is it going to change the chip thickness? It will probably change the chip thickness. She, she, you totally weren't looking... I, after I let go of the candy, I said, yeah, it's going to go over her head. <laughs> I, could, I could just hear myself explaining it to the uh, campus police. Professor assaults student. <laughs> it's a professor assaults student who was texting. <laughs> no, I wasn't assault. I mean, I was, I guess I did assault her, but it was on accident. Oh, but it wasn't you that I was worried about. The person in front of you was, was looking at their phone at the moment I was letting go of the candy. And I was like, oh, if I missed, it's going to hit her. And now she's all got red face and everything. <sighs> I didn't mean to call you out. I'm sure you were um, sending notes about the class to one of your classmates. Yeah, I'm certain. Um, uh, rake angle. So we get to choose that. And so what happens, and what we haven't drawn on this picture yet, is somewhere here, this is uncut chip thickness. This is chip thickness. Somewhere the workpiece stops being workpiece and starts being chip. So you really could draw like, like three free body diagrams that represent the same thing. You could draw a free body diagram from perspective of the chip. You could draw a free body diagram from the perspective of the workpiece, and you could draw a free body diagram from the perspective of the tool. All the forces have to be the same, unless it's accelerating. Right? So you can you can look at it from any perspective. Now you have to change units depending on because the tool's pushing on the workpiece, the workpiece is pushing on the tool, the tool's pushing on the chip, the chip's pushing on the tool. So you can look at any of those three sets. Um, we always Start the forces at the tip of the tool because that's the easiest one to keep track of. But something's happening here, right? 
something's happening right there that's causing the workpiece to no longer be workpiece and to start becoming chip. And what's happening is that the metal's shearing. So it always fails in shear. And that shearing is breaking the grains free from each other and squishing them together. So all of that energy here, well, that's F sub S for shear force. And of course, there's got to be a force normal to the shear force because we're doing orthogonal coordinate systems. And those two added together equal P. Um, I forget. I think we call that S. I could look at my slides. There's another force in there that adds together. So what's important about this force? Oh, and there's an angle here too, right? And it's the shear angle. And I will look at the slide because I always remember things wrong. Actually, why don't I bring up a slide? It'll be easier to see. I got to get to the right slide. Time to go yet. We have six minutes left. All right, so here's everything drawn with straight lines. So we've got our cutting force, our thrust force, we've got our friction force. And our normal force, we've got our shear force. Oh, it's Fn, we call it. We knew it wasn't S. Uh, because of the way I drew this, the angles all kind of line up with each other. But that's Fn, and that's the force normal to the shear force. That has to add together to also eat the equal the resultant force. Now, this shear force is happening primarily because of the material that we chose. So material that has takes more energy to cut, right? Remember I told you the stainless steel was seven times more energy than aluminum to cut? So the material that takes more energy to cut is going to have a longer shear zone. That force is gonna be longer because it has takes more energy to cut right there. So for the same, for the same incremental depth or for the same uncut chip thickness. And then the, the chip thickness will be different too, probably, right? Because of that, they'll, they'll be related. So you can get that from there. Let's go back a couple slides. All right, so it's not quite as fast as it changes on my screen. Threw me for a minute, it wasn't the same thing. Um, all right, so we've got our uncut chip thickness and our chip thickness. We measure the chip thickness, we, know, we pick the uncut chip thickness. We can take a ratio of the uncut chip thickness and the chip thickness. Again, not very imaginative, we call it R because it's a ratio, we call it R sub T because it's a ratio. And it turns out that from geometry, you can prove, and I believe you can prove it, because once for an extra credit assignment for the class, I assigned the class to prove this equation to me. And that was a pain to grade because not everybody went the same method to prove it. Um, so I'm not gonna ask that again because I don't wanna grade it again. But the tangent of the shear angle, so the shear angle is this angle here, the tangent of that angle is going to be equal to cosine of the rake angle times RT divided by one minus RT times the sine of the rake angle. And that's always gonna be true. And so if you know the shear angle and you know the rake angle, because if you know the rake angle, you know the direction the, the um, friction force is applied, right? because it's got to be along the rake face. So it's got to be aligned with that, that plane. If you know the rake angle, 
and you know the shear angle, you can move from any of these coordinate systems to any other coordinate system. So if you know the cutting force and the thrust force, you can figure out what's the friction force and the normal force. You can figure out what's the shear force and the force normal to the shear, which I wish we had a better name for. Right, you could do that. If I told you to do it, you could all figure it out, correct? Yes, you could all figure it out. You could derive all of the equations needed to do it, correct? Yeah. Right, you could. But we're engineers, right? I, I used to have this thing. <laughs> I used to have this thing that I said, but I'm, an in, but I'm lazy, so let's figure out an easier way to do it. It turns out that's bad mental programming for yourself, especially if you are lazy. You shouldn't repeat over and over again, I'm lazy, because that will just reinforce it and it'll make you accept being lazy. It'll make you want to be lazy. It will totally make you become lazy, even if it wasn't true when you started saying it. So I would cut those thoughts out. Anyway, if you look through the rest of the slides in this, uh, this presentation, there, and there's lots of them. There might be, this might be the biggest presentation I have. It's like 50, 60 slides. I don't know. There's a lot of them. There's equations on there that step you through moving from one force system to another force system. My gift to you, so you don't have to, um, what's the word? Derive them, right? Because somebody else already derived them. And remember that a few years in the lab could save you a few hours or a few days in the library and a few minutes on Google. Um, so as we go through this, but you'll want to, you'll, you'll find the relationships between those things. I think it's, much more important to understand and the geometry of what's happening than it is to go through a list of equations with you one after the other. But if you want to see me go through a list of equations, one of those other videos down at the bottom of the sheet, I'm sure I've done that in the past. And so you can see me put all the equations on the screen. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here today. I know this is the hardest day of the year to come to class of the term. Hardest day. It is... It is indeed hump day of hump week today. And um, today, to get a piece of candy, you had to answer a question. Tomorrow, I have to think you answered correctly. Have a good day.